Silent Hill has reached the limit. Nothing is going to be the way it was. The future of Silent Hill becomes more misty and dark. Make yourself comfortable, and here's the fifth story from the town of Silent Hill. After releasing the fourth part of Silent Hill, Konami decided to split the team called Team Silent that was responsible for the previous games and let them work independently. The development of the following parts was supposed to be entrusted to outsourcing companies. It's still not quite clear what motivated Konami to make such a cardinal decision. From one of the artists of Homecoming, the following game in the franchise, people found out that the company's management team didn't like how the games looked like. Konami wanted something new from the series, some original vision, new attitude, new stories and challenges. Even though both players and critics spoke the words of praise for those games, whether it's true or not, I think we'll never find out. The only member of the original team who stayed and continued his work on the franchise was none other than an irreplaceable composer and music maker Akira Yamaoka. Apart from that, the development of the next part was entrusted to a British studio called Climax, they decided to come back to the story about the cult of Silent Hill. And this time we have not the following part, but a prequel of the game. Although at first there were speculations that there would be a reboot or a remake of the first game with Rose De Silva as the main protagonist from the movie instead of Harry Mason. At first this game was supposed to be called Silent Hill Original Sin. The prototype now looks more like a Resident Evil 4 clone. The game was shown to the public on E3 in 2006 and was supposed to be released at the end of the same year. But the development went wrong, it was decided to make new adjustments to the game and make it look and feel like the original games. Still, the game will be released only one year later. We will be shown how the whole story started many years ago. Because when Harry Mason, the main hero of the first game, went to Silent Hill, it had already been devoured by darkness. Now players will be thrown back in time, seven years before the events of the first part. The game will tell us about the fire in Alessa's house, how alternative reality appeared in Silent Hill, and how the soul of the girl divided into two parts. The only thing I would like to mention up front is that the key platform for this game was PlayStation Portable. Because this was the first portable console from Sony, the company tried to motivate players to buy this console by releasing exclusive high-quality games even for well-known franchises, such as Metal Gear Solid or God of War, for example including Silent Hill. After some time, the game was reworked for PlayStation 2, but you should understand that the game was designed for the low powers of that portable console. As a result, because of some problems with emulation, the quality of graphics... it's not awful, but still far from perfect. The main glitch that slightly ruins the experience is the flashlight that is cut in half if you try to improve the resolution. But if the flashlight is turned off, everything works perfectly. Unfortunately, this game can be very extremely dark sometimes, so playing without a flashlight is simply impossible sometimes. If you decide to play with the native resolution of PlayStation 2, the flashlight works perfectly though. I apologize in advance for a different quality of recorded materials here. If you notice that the quality of video changes from time to time, it's… that's why. We'll talk about some technical specifications slightly later, but for now, let's start talking about the game already. As I've already said, the events of the game take place seven years before the events of the first game, in 1976. A lot of you ask me where I got the dates. I should tell you that not all dates are official and not all of them fit properly. But more or less official dates with a margin of error of five years appear in the official document dedicated to Silent Hill Homecoming. As you can see here, there's the date of the events of the first game mentioned. 1980 something. The last number is either 3 or 8. I don't know about you, but I see number 3 here. Further notes support my guesses. For example, it's written that the events of Silent Hill 2 occur either in 1993 or 1998. So if the events of the first game occurred in 1983 and Cheryl was 7 years old at that moment, 1983 minus 7 is 1976. This time the name of the main character is Travis Grady. A long-distance truck driver who decided to shorten his way and go through the town of Silent Hill to deliver cargo on time. 
But suddenly a woman or girl in the hood ran out on the road, and only a great reaction of Travis helped him to avoid the disastrous outcome. After a sudden stop, Travis decided to go outside to check the figure. In the mirror of the truck he saw a little girl in the mist, that came out of nowhere and started approaching Travis. After this the little girl he saw in the mirror appeared on the road and Travis decided to help her. I'm not sure why he decided to go on foot and leave his truck, but this way he entered Silent Hill. Right after that he saw a burning house and heard screams coming from there. Without skipping a beat, he ran into the house, trying to help a girl, who had already got burnt pretty much. You're coming with me. The whole building is aflame, but some paranormal activity helps to put the fire out, clear the way and leave the place. And when the protagonist comes out of the house, he passes out. Safe now. Hey, someone help her. Where is everyone? Players who already played the previous games know that was happening there at that moment. That house belonged to the Gillespie family, and that poor burnt girl was Alessa. And Travis just happened to be the witness of the ritual and managed to interrupt it unintentionally. He wakes up the following day on one of the streets of Silent Hill. Silent Hill? What happened last night? That girl? Did she make it? Before leaving the town, Travis decides to visit the Burns girl and find out about her condition. In order to do that, he decides to visit the closest hospital, Alcamilla. In these dark corridors, he meets a familiar face, Michael Kaufman. He will say that there was no girl with burns and leave the place. Hey, you a doctor? Can I help you? That fire last night. The girl who was burned. Is she here? A girl? We've received no new patients in the last day or so. I'm sorry, perhaps someone in reception could help you. I have urgent business to attend to. Goodbye. Shortly after that, monsters will start showing themselves. Yes? You okay? What? In one of the rooms, Travis will see Alessa's reflection, and after coming closer and touching the blueprint of her hand, he will be dragged into another world. Although I usually talk about gameplay features after the plot, I should tell you about this aspect of the game right now, I think. This time that dark reality doesn't suddenly fall on the character. Travis can freely pass through these worlds at his own will, using all mirrors he finds on the levels. After a long run in the hospital, Travis will find a very strange object that looks like a pyramid. But we already know that this is a part of the Flores artifact, which was used by Harry Mason in the first game. Soon Alessa will show up out of nowhere. Unable to ask even a few questions, Travis will pass out and wake up at the hospital's reception. There we'll be able to see another familiar character, a nurse Lisa. Sorry, did I startle you? My name is Lisa. I'm a trainee here. She will tell Travis that the girl from the fire died. She will also tell him that she has to go to the local sanatorium, where Dr. Kaufman is waiting for her. For some unknown reason, our protagonist decides to go the same way, where he will find Dahlia, Alessa's mother, being strange as always. Without answering a single of his questions, she goes away. You all left that girl to burn. So we did. The world is stranger than you think. Later in the intensive therapy unit, he will meet Lisa again, who is really concerned about the health of one of their patients. Who are you talking about? Is the girl inside? Alessa? Is Alessa in there? No. No! You know who's in there! And according to the notes we could find, this patient happens to be Helen Grady. She's the mother of our protagonist, but in the form of a monster. And of course, we'll have to fight her. Come here, boy. Let Mama take a look at you.
In the meantime, I'll tell you what she's doing there. It turns out that when Travis was a child, she tried to kill him and herself, but both of them were rescued. After the incident, Helen was sent to psychiatric treatment. She claimed that people in the mirror told her to kill her own son. Probably she was able to see that dark world through the mirrors, just like Travis. That's what you do with pests. That's what you do, isn't it? And he was a pest. Oh, he was a bad boy. Always has been. I tried to pretend he wasn't, but they were there to make sure I didn't forget. They? The people in the mirrors. They see it all. She was placed to sanitarium called Setter Grove in Silent Hill. Travis and his dad also moved to Silent Hill so they could visit and support her. But when they visited her, she could become aggressive and violent. So the dad decided to tell Travis that his mother died, so the boy didn't have to look at her condition. After dealing with Helen, Travis will grab another part of Loras. Alessa shows up again, and Travis loses consciousness again. The next place a player will visit will be Arto Theater, where he will be met by Lisa, and she will show all her acting abilities there. I can't stop thinking about you, Travis. I want you. You're all I think about. Let's get the hell out of this crazy town. Run off. The two of us. We could be so good together. <laughs> See? I could be a star! Apart from that, nothing important will happen there. Just after defeating a boss, Travis will find another part of Flores. After that, he will go to the Riverside Motel. He remembers that he visited that place before, but had forgotten about it a long time ago. Riverside Motel. I think I've been there before. In order to remember everything, he will thoroughly explore the area, change the world several times, and even catch Lisa and Kaufman in the act of the bedroom scene. Before leaving the room, the doctor will recommend Travis leave the city as soon as possible for his own good. You have a habit of popping up where you're not wanted, Mr. Grady. Isn't it time you left town? I can't. Try harder. But Travis will not follow his advice and will make it up to room 500, where he will find his dad hanging on the rope. Daddy, this is insane. Time you faced up to what happened. Your mother and I will see you in heaven, son. The thing is that when Helen was taken into the sanitarium, Travis moved with his dad to Silent Hill and stayed exactly in that room. And we already know what happened next. Richard told his son that his mother died, but suffered a lot because of that lie. Once, Richard gave his son some coins for slot machines and hanged himself in the room. When Travis found the body of his father, he didn't call for help. He stayed in that room for 10 hours straight, until a maid found him. During that episode, Travis was holding a quarter coin that his dad had given him before, and Travis still carries it wherever he goes. You can even find it in the inventory. It's not hard to guess that his dad will turn into a monster as well, and after his death, we'll get another part of Flores. And again, Alessa shows up. Travis loses his temper and asks her why she's doing that. Why does he have to remember all those horrible things that concern his parents? But he again passes out and wakes up in the Alcamilla hospital, where he will find the final part of Flores. By putting all pieces together, he released Alessa into the real world. Before that, Alessa only appeared in the supernatural world. It turns out that Dahlia used Flores to imprison Alessa's supernatural powers and keep them there. Then she divided the artifact into several parts and hid them in the city. But Travis managed to find them all, brought Alessa's powers back and released her. This way the supernatural world leaked into reality. This is how Silent Hill appeared, the way we know it. But the Elder Gillespie claims that Travis won't be able to stop their call that way or another. Even with your misguided help, she can't stop us now. The ceremony begins soon. Finally, she will birth God! Of course we should stop them from fulfilling their plans. He goes to the closest antique shop where a secret church of cult is situated and interferes the ceremony. There he sees a real burnt Alessa. But Dr. Kaufman stops Travis. He gets surrounded by some gas, passes out and wakes up in his own nightmare. There he will fight against the demon which was imprisoned in the artifact. In the end, Travis somehow uses Flores and splits Alessa's soul into two parts. After that, Travis gets out of the town where he finds his truck. In the side mirror, he sees Alessa who's holding a baby. 
he smiles and continues his way. After that, a player will be able to listen to two more audio files. One of them is the dialogue between Harry Mason and his wife when they find a newborn child on the road, and call her Cheryl. And another dialogue between Kaufman and Dahlia. They say that without another half of Alessa's soul, they won't be able to resurrect God, so they will try to use a summoning spell. Hearing the suffering of the other half, the lost part of the soul will return to Silent Hill. Although it may take a while. And as we already know, it will take seven long years. Based on the events of this part of the game and the fact that Travis will appear in one more game, we may call that ending as canon. At least while playing the game for the first time, a player will get this ending. But that was not the only one. After completing the game for the second time, a player could get other endings. If a player managed to kill more than a hundred monsters, then Travis would find himself in a different place and situation. Being stuck in a supernatural world, Travis will be tied to a gurney. On the background, a player will be able to hear screams of people he allegedly met. This may lead you to the conclusion that all those monsters he fought against were just mere people. And in the end, we can see that one of the followers of the cult is watching him. This time players could even see the ending with aliens. If players during the second walkthrough could find a special key and carry it to the motel, they would be able to open the door that had been closed before. Then a drawn cutscene will start, where Travis will be able to meet an alien and a dog from the spaceship. Players could find them in the bonus ending of the second Silent Hill. Travis will ask him if the alien saw his truck. Alien will reply that the truck is on another planet and offer Travis to go there. And Travis will accept the offer. Your truck is on our planet. Come with us. Can I drive? You drive stick? Now let's take the plot away and talk about game mechanics. Still, a new company could bring something new to a well-established series of games. And they actually did. But I have to say that the first three games were taken as a basis for this one, especially the second part. Among important innovations, I can mention once again the ability to travel between two worlds using an mirror in the game. If there is no necessary thing in one world, a player could travel through the mirror and try to find it in another one. If the door is locked on the one side, it may be open on the other side. This mechanics played its role extremely well in the theater. A player had to change decorations to change the room in another world, turn it into a forest or library for example. The same structure of levels but with different decorations could lengthen the gameplay, saving the memory and resources of the system. Developers managed to turn disadvantages into a feature, and I can appreciate that. But battle mechanics has changed a lot. For the first time in the franchise, quick time events appeared. If an enemy came really close, a player had to push a certain button several times in order to get rid of the hold of a monster unharmed. The problem is that monsters could attack a player so fast that he might not even have a chance to react to fight back. So most of the fights started from these QTE moments. But still it's not really that bad. The second change happened to be much more serious. Melee attack weapons could break. And most of them could break really fast. In the fourth part some weapons also could break, but mostly as an exception. In this game, every stick or pipe had their own strength reserve. You can notice a small cross near every weapon. The color of this cross indicates the condition of a weapon before it breaks – green, yellow and red. So players had to constantly look for hammers, axes, bats and other heavy things. And on the one hand, it added another element of surviving, but on the other hand, seriously struck the atmosphere. Since even some unobvious items could be used as weapons – a writing machine, mini TV set, file cabinet, toaster, drip stands, basin and even a bottle of spirit. Sometimes it looked ridiculous. A player could even use fists to knock down his enemies, 
punch a nurse in the face and kick her to death. In this situation, it's not quite obvious who's the monster here. The location also changed. At first, the central part of Silent Hill was limited by Hospital Alchemilla, but in this game, developers decided to add a couple of blocks with a theater, sanatorium and hotel. Some streets also changed their locations, but in general, this misty town mostly remained the same. Now I think I should tell you about monsters that a player could meet on his way. Of course, nurses were still there. In this game, they've changed their appearance a bit and used a huge syringe as a weapon, but in general, they are the same as we remember. A straight jacket monster does remind a lying figure from the second Silent Hill. The only thing is that this monster now can stick to our protagonist and spit on him. From human-like monsters, players could meet so-called remnants, transparent figures that cast a human-like shadow, which were wandering in Setter Grove. In the theater, a player could stumble upon aerials, dolls who could walk not only on the floor, but also on the ceiling, where they could easily grab our protagonist. Now let's come over to more specific types of enemies. One of them was called Carrion, that has resemblance with a dead animal, which was hit by a car. Being a driver, Travis probably saw a lot of dead animals on the roads, and probably even unintentionally killed some of them. And now those corpses have come to life and want Travis dead. There were two types of these monsters, but the differences were really simple. The size, the amount of health, and attack power. Two back, as you may guess, was two human bodies grown together. Probably symbolizes the lack of relationship because of Travis's job. Or parents of Travis, his mom who became a heavy burden for his father because of her illness. Then we have bosses. Mother of Travis was hanging on the ceiling in some sort of cage with spares, which pierced her body through. At some point, this boss reminded Mary from Silent Hill 2. At first, father of Travis showed himself in human form, but later transformed into a huge creature, which was made out of torn human legs and head with a long neck. Besides, one of his attacks is strangling. I wonder why. In the theater, Travis could find Caliban, a huge creature with legs covered with fur. And this name was chosen on purpose because Caliban is one of the characters of the writing The Tempest, written by Shakespeare. This character looked like a dog and when Alessa saw it on the stage in the theater, she was scared because, as we remember, she was scared of dogs. And this fear escalated into such a monster. After defeating the boss, it becomes a common monster and can be met on the streets of Silent Hill. The next boss was the Butcher. A player could meet this monster several times through the game, but closer to the end of the game, players will have to lock horns with this monster. He carries a huge backsword, killing all enemies on his way. And there is a strange half of some helmet shining on his head. Finally, the last boss. His name is Alice's Dream. This boss looked much like Incubus from the first part, and a typical devil we can find in different movies and books. The battle is happening kind of inside Flores, and as Alessa's mother told her that it was a cage for the devil, so she imagined a typical devil inside it. But despite the fact that the developers tried to recapture the atmosphere of previous games, Origins didn't quite make it. First of all, the plot. And even the fact that we all know how the story ends is not the case. The thing is that we can call this game a prequel with a great reserve. Important things only happen at the beginning of the game and closer to the end. Between those points, we look for the parts of the artifact and watch a personal story of Travis, about how his parents died. It would be a different matter if the story was deep and detailed, like in the second game, but it's quite superficial. The game only reminds about it in cutscenes when players have to fight another monster. But the main thing here is that the personal story of Travis is not connected to the story of Alessa at all. Secondly, many times this game descends to the level of simply copying the previous games. The appearance of the monster is mentioned before, for example. It can be explained, though. One of the developers claimed that they were inspired mostly by Silent Hill 2. I'm not sure whether it's good or bad, everyone decides for themselves, I guess. And if nurses and monsters and straitjackets may even be okay, the Butcher monster is a vivid copy of Pyramid Head. And if in the second part this monster had a certain symbolism, the Butcher is just hanging around with that huge backsword, killing other monsters and his head is covered with some sort of a metal mask. But in terms of the plot, he doesn't bring anything into it. And if there were no such a monster, nothing would change, honestly. Yes, this monster may represent the inner anger and cruelty of Travis, but the Butcher is not really a threat and is shown twice through the game. Also, the attempts of copying the other world turned out to be not so good. This way, the developers performed a certain minimum, just copied the familiar elements without too many changes. 
The overall quality of graphics was pretty fine for a portable console. PSP in terms of specs was really limited, that's why developers had to perform some serious measures to cover bad graphics. For example, that noise effect while fighting with monsters was so intensive that the player sometimes could barely sort out what was happening on the screen. Plus, the locations and levels were really dark, so it was really hard to navigate there, even with a working flashlight. It was excusable for a portable console, but when this game was ported to PlayStation 2, it was really sad to look at that quality. Graphics was barely improved and in comparison with, for example, Silent Hill 3, couldn't hold up against criticism. I mean, if you didn't know that the game was ported from PSP and start playing Origins after Silent Hill 3, you would be shocked to see such a quality of graphics. The funny thing is that annoying noise effect could be turned off, but in order to do that, players had to finish the game. Why not to allow turning it off right from the beginning remains unknown. This function was available in the bonus menu. And I think it's time to tell you about those bonuses that waited for players after finishing the game once or more times. These are mostly costumes, even more than had Heather in the third part. Fireman, military man, wrestler, butcher, Indiana Jones, even the appearance of Vincent from the third part. Or a huge dog that looks like the one from the bonus ending from Silent Hill 2. Of course, these costumes added some insanity to the cutscenes. Where am I? Those costumes could be opened after gaining some achievements, which were called accolades here. In general, there were 14 of them. Some of them are standard, like get this or that ending. Some of them are more specific. Finish the game without saves. Save Alessa in the house within 80 seconds. To use flashlight less than 3 hours, and many other things. But costumes were not the only reward for completing those conditions. Equipment was also a part of it. For completing the game with a good ending, a player could get a bit weird looking gloves, moon gauntlets, which could deal a lot of damage and didn't break. After the bad ending, a player could get the backsword, which could also deal a lot of damage and didn't break. The funny thing is that the Butcher himself could barely carry that weapon, and Travis easily swings it around in one hand. The ending with aliens allowed players to find a Tesla gun in the inventory, a powerful long-ranged weapon. Also, there were an axe and night vision goggles, and these goggles could really help in dark locations, but still, that green screen hit the atmosphere in a bad way. I already mentioned the bonus menu. Besides the option to turn off the noise effect, players could find some additional settings. For example, make Travis run all the time, turn extra blood on, or make Travis leave bloody footprints after him. And like the icing on the cake, was an opportunity to change the silhouette of a flashlight, turn it into a smiley or a soccer ball. As a result, a player could put the costume of a dog on Travis, with Tesla gun and a flashlight with the silhouette of Halloween pumpkin. One last thing I would like to mention. If you go upstairs near the mail department, you'll be able to see the pupae of some huge insects, perhaps silkworm. This may be the reference to the first part when Harry Mason had to fight against a huge silkworm, but seven years after the events of the game in Origins. But don't think that Climax made a bad game, it's not like that. The original games about Silent Hill were unique, and because of that, even their copy looked… okay. Besides, Akira Yamaoka was still in charge of the soundtrack, and again, it was gorgeous. The thing is that from the game, players expected the creative approach to monsters, locations, dramatic plot, charismatic characters, and not this. It seems like all elements are in place, but they didn't quite work out together. There was even the news that in the beginning developers wanted to make the Silent Hill as a dark sitcom like Scrubs, for example. And only several months before the release, they gave up on this idea and reworked the major part of the game. In that case, such a creative approach would be over the odds, in my opinion. And for such a decision, a lot of fans would go furious about that. This only proves that the development process was mostly a mess and the creator simply didn't know what to do with this legacy. But there we have it. Maybe that's why this episode is shorter than previous ones. It's just simply not much to tell. And the next time will be probably the same. As I've already told you, Silent Hill started losing its charm and original atmosphere. But probably the most disliked Silent Hill game will be waiting for you in the next video. And this is the end for now. Thank you for watching. See you in several weeks.